do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. This is a webinar sp sponsored by Trans Network. We are a research and education partnership in the South. We are building capacity and working in so many areas uh, in the South to make sure that trans and non-binary uh, people and communities um, experience empowerment and liberation in their lives, not just uh, surviving. And we are so thrilled that you've joined us today for a conversation about rural environments in the South. Uh, as we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we are all working on different land that was often unseated, uh, that was often stolen. I personally am working on Muscogee, Crete, and Cherokee land, and probably many other tribes that we have not, um, that have been erased, uh, that we don't have names for. I think as we get started today, we also wanted to just acknowledge that anti-blackness and uh, racism against uh, brown and black folks cont continues and persist. So in our work uh, with trans and non-binary people in the South, we just really honor and recognize that this work is intricately connected to uprooting anti-blackness and moving not just from addressing anti-blackness, but moving towards pro-blackness and pro-people of color in general. So um, I am thrilled that you all are here with us today. My name is Annalise Singh. I'm at the University of Georgia, and I use she, she and they pronouns. I'm about to move to Tulane University in New Orleans, so i um, excited about that move. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge that we're in a pandemic. So the last time we did one of our webinars, we were not, uh, but we are so grateful to be connected with you all uh, today. I wanted to introduce our incredible panelists today. Uh, we have Jamie Roberts, who just signed on. Um, uh, Jamie uses she, her, hers pronouns. It is a native of Georgia, born and raised in Griffin, Georgia, as a current re resident of East Lake neighborhood of Atlanta. She's active in trans and gender nonconforming community and uh, volunteers for several organizations, including the awesome Trans Housing Atlanta program. Uh, she has a background of 25 plus years in law and is finishing the David Lynch MFA in screenwriting and is pursuing a second career in film and digital media. Welcome, uh, Jamie, we're so glad you're here. Aim Simmons uh, uses he, him, his pronouns as a queer white trans man serving in Equality North Carolina's policy director and is senior lecturing fellow at Duke Law School. His work is rooted in community-based efforts, prioritizing anti-violence, anti-oppression, and transgender justice. Ames, thank you for your work over so many years and decades, and we're just so just thrilled to have you here. Um, <laughs> the amazing Tori Cooper. Oh my gosh, I just love any space I get to be in with her. Uh, she, her, hers pronouns. She is the director of community engagement for the Transgender Justice Initiative, the Human Rights Campaign. She's a health and equity advocate, community organizer, educator, published author, a leader in trans and HIV communities. She has more than 30 years of experience at all levels of HIV service. She's transformed kind of how we do trans and non-binary support in Atlanta, Georgia, I would say in our nation and our world founder of Advocates for Better Care Atlanta, and now serves as HRC's Director of Community Engagement. They need some of that, so we are so glad you are there. And uh, then we have Christopher Stevens, who uses he, him, they, them pronouns. Christopher is also incredible. 33 years old, gay, trans, masculine person, current executive director of the Arkansas Transgender Equity Collaborative, a small grassroots nonprofit, but that is very effective, that serves as a resource for the trans community. Christopher is also a case manager at Jericho Way, serving people who experience homelessness, as well as a shelter advocate staff member uh, for Lucy's Place, serving LGBTQ youth who are experiencing homelessness. We do have, um, uh, also, Becca Estevez, who I wanted to give a special shout out to, who uses she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, we work closely together in Trans Network. She is a fourth year PhD student in counseling psych at UGA, founding member of the UGA College of Ed Committee for Trans Affirming Practices and project coordinator of uh, Project Affirm Atlanta, um, and is a student rep for the American Psych Division 44, the Queer and Trans Division. Um, her work is working with Latinx, uh, trans and non-binary um, individuals. Uh, we also have Hannah Jones, who uses she, her, hers pronouns, who is a family nurse practitioner in Russellville, Arkansas. She works largely with 
socioeconomic, uh, low socioeconomic rural communities with limited access to a lot of things. Hannah couldn't be with us today. Hannah had some emergencies come up, but we do have some of her responses. So welcome everyone. We are excited to be with you today. We have a 60 minute webinar and we'll have a robust Q&A at the end. So please, I wanted to orient you to our webinar. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to put your questions there. We'll also be asking you to dialogue in the chat box. Trans Network is not one of those things where we just kind of present and try to bank information into you. We want to dialogue with you. We want to understand more how we can work on empowerment and liberation initiatives with trans and non-binary people in rural areas. So please, audience, we are dialoguing with you today. So as we get started, um, I just want to turn to Ames in North Carolina and just say, you know, hey, we are in the era of COVID-19 and a lot of other stuff. <laughs> I mean, COVID-19 is the great revealer of so many things we already knew when it came to inequities. But in thinking about access to new resources and things we could potentially lose post of state of emergency and the already the lack of access to resources in rural areas, could you talk about some of the things you're seeing go on in North Carolina right now? Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, I am in Raleigh, which is not rural North Carolina, but it is land that was stolen from the Catawba Nation. Um, Equality North Carolina is a statewide organization, so we have been hearing from people all across North Carolina, which is a majority rural state, like I think every state in the South. During the pandemic, um, which is still now, um, Equality North Carolina created a resource page on our website to help make it easier for people to get all the things that unemployment or illness has, um, has taken away from them. Um, like food pantries and housing supports. But we also have been fielding calls from trans people who live outside of urban areas and are having difficulty finding resources in their area. Um, for example, we had um, a couple who had to relocate to Surrey County, which is in a rural northwestern part of the state that has only about 70,000 people. And the I think the biggest city there is Mount Airy, which it was the town that Mayberry was modeled on in the old Andy Griffith series, if that tells you anything. Wow. Um, and these folks um, needed access to emergency income support, and they were also looking for a provider for hormone replacement therapy, and eventually for a surgeon um, who can provide gender confirmation surgery, which we know so many hospitals have put on hold to free up space for COVID-19 patients. Our sibling organization, Campaign for Southern Equality in Asheville, has offered emergency relief grants, as has Transmission in Asheville, um, in the western part of the state, and we know that those funds get exhausted within hours of them getting put up. So our folks in Surrey County um, didn't get one. Um, so we're trying to find a mobile needle exchange that would at least provide access to syringes if these folks were able to get to the sliding scale trans health clinic in Asheville in order to get a prescription. But that is a three hour drive from, from Mount Airy. And it's not at all unusual for people, trans people to tell us that they drive hours in order to find a healthcare provider who will give us you know, the medically necessary healthcare that we need. But since North Carolina has legalized um, syringe services, um, we found that trans people who otherwise don't get access to clean needles can get them through these needle exchanges. Um, I have sourced needles there um, when, when, I, when I was having difficulty with pharmacies. <laughs> um, so the fixed site locations have mostly closed during the pandemic, but many of the mobile services like North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition have continued providing incredibly important healthcare resources to marginally, marginalized folks out in the community. Um, we also created um, online support space for transgender and gender non-conforming people. I think some of my colleagues at Equality NC 
uh, who helmed that effort, Rebbe Kern and Artie Hartzell are on the call or in the audience today. Um, and many folks were expressing difficulty with accessing telehealth, including um, one person who was afraid to have their therapy visits by, um, by phone because they knew their partner could overhear um, that therapy. And we know that being confined in spaces with unsupportive family during the pandemic has created significant stress in the community. However, those therapy visits are required by their insurer before they can get gender confirmation surgery. So this person, in addition to everything else, is worried about when they're gonna be able to get their surgery, which they have to have in order to update um, a North Carolina birth certificate. So our work, our advocacy work is not done and we need to undo that statute. Um, almost done. Our colleagues at Campaign for Southern Equality also um, created online support space and also even space for trans people to talk about trans health with the patient coordinator from the sliding scale clinic in Asheville that we call Winches, the Western um, North Carolina Community Health Services. Folks from South Carolina and even Florida were calling in to try to help come up with creative ways that we could um, provide mutual aid for each other in the absence of, of um, systems being able to provide that. But to be sure, COVID-19 is merely bringing to light systemic inequities that have been failing trans people since the beginning of time. Um, even before the pandemic, I was spending time, for example, trying to help an older disabled woman um, who was trans uh, and trying to live near Boone, um, another rural area. And she had faced so much discrimination from the only hospital in her area that the sheriff's office had told her she would be arrested if she came back. So she was driving two and a half hours to another hospital um, in order to get the care that she needed. Um, or the last example I'll give, we were trying to help a trans woman in far eastern North Carolina in New Bern, which um, is proud to say they're the home of Pepsi. And since I'm a native Atlantan, I don't acknowledge Pepsi in any way. Um, oh my gosh. A very rural area. Um, so this trans lady who had end stage renal disease um, had so much harassment from her dialysis um, treatment provider that they terminated her access to this life-saving service and told her that she would have to go to the hospital from now on multiple times a week to get her dialysis. So uh, again, we know these are being brought into relief by the COVID crisis, but they've been there all along for trans folks. Yeah, thank you, Ames. And I know as you are kind of leading and kind of advocating in this area, I mean, you're, you are hearing the things that we already know, but are there resiliencies or opportunities that you see that are opening up in terms of getting people connected to resources or identifying like more, I don't know, intricately what the issues are? I would say that we have seen a number of, of these mutual aid societies that have sprung up to try to get resources to folks. I know that I have, um, donated to several of those across the state. Um, there's been a push for folks to donate their stimulus checks if they are fortunate enough to get one, which of course not everybody gets one, um, in order to, to try to help people get access. Um, I'll talk some more um, toward the end about some of the advocacy efforts that, um, that we've been a part of to try to make sure that people um, can get what they need. Um, but these, I would especially lift up Transmission, who um, ha has made themselves available to, you know, email us if, um, if you have, if you're facing housing problems or, or difficulty getting access to hormones, and we can, we can work it out together. And um, we know that we are the ones that keep us safer and healthier. Um, and particularly local um, community-based organizations are, are really coming through, but we can't depend on community-based organizations um, to, to always be there to, to have our backs. This is the responsibility of all of us. Thank you, Ames. I mean, I think that's what I've seen over, over, over and over again, even in New Orleans, I know like 
you know, trans communities of color, non-binary communities of color, like raising like lots of money and then the money just gets assigned pretty quickly and then there's more opportunities to donate and share resources. So thank you so much for sharing about the work in North Carolina. We're gonna head across, you know, the country to um, Jamie and Tori and just curious uh, for the both of you about creative and expansive advocacy. So for instance, like how, let's just start with a question of how the pandemic has affected the organizations that you're supporting. Yeah, we'll go with Tori first. We'll tag Tori and then Jamie. So good morning, everyone. I think it's still more. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will first start off by saying today has been an emotionally different, difficult one uh, because of everything that we're hearing in the news. Um, and I wouldn't be me if I didn't talk um, from the viewpoint of a black person and as a black trans person and as a black trans person who lives in the South and as a black trans person who identifies as binary, uh, female. Um, so with all of those different things, um, what we're seeing with organizations in the COVID mess, um, there's really no other way to describe it, is that many of the organizations that we serve simply were not up to capacity through technology, um, through finances, to really sustain themselves, certainly at the beginning. Um, our last day in the office at HRC was March 9th. And we were encouraged to take our computers home. Um, and then we got an email um, that effectively shut the business down out of a sense of public safety and urgency, which was really, really early compared to a lot of other businesses. So I, I certainly commend them for, for that. Um, we're fortunate. We were able to work from home and do a very, very quick turnaround. Um, many of the organizations that we serve were not able to do so. Um, we found out that there's many organizations who couldn't afford um, even a Zoom account. Um, that would allow uh, them to utilize Zoom meetings for more than 40 minutes. Uh, we realized that there were some agencies who, who, whose employees didn't have computers and cell phones and tablets that they could actually download Zoom and or go to meetings or Skype or something else. And because the shutdown happened so quickly, it's been a difficult thing getting um, as much as we could, helping organizations get up to par. And so um, that's been a challenge. And then of course the financial issues. Um, organizations that perhaps had uh, events planned around uh, National HIV Testing Day, Trans HIV Testing Day, National Transgender HIV Testing Day, which was April the 18th. Um, there were a lot of organizations who didn't have the capacity to not only test transgender folks for HIV, but also to participate in national programming for that. And I'll just use that as one example. And so what we're doing is we're playing catch up. We're playing catch up in terms of raising money. Um, we're playing catch up in, in, in terms of raising um, knowledge around technology and capacity. Uh, we're playing catch up in terms of meeting deliverables for contracts um, because the work still has to be done. Um, we're playing catch up in a lot of different ways. And unfortunately, uh, we're finding that of all folks, trans folks, particularly those of us who are of color and then black trans folks, because people of color and black are, are two different things. Black people are people of color but people of color are not just black. And it's important to understand that people of color is a public health term that describes everybody that's not white. And so from a public health standpoint, it's unfair and inequitable to count black people simply as people of color because there's no group of people on the face of the earth who have greater risk and mortality and morbidity from public health illnesses and public health crises than black people. 
So that was my high horse moment. Um, and so we're having a difficult time. Um, there's some incredible success stories. Uh, there's an incredible amount of resilience that we're seeing. Um, we're getting help from outside sources and most importantly, help from our own communities. Well, we're seeing uh, black folks um, and people of color and trans folks um, who are creating COVID rapid resource funds. Um, they're national organizations that are seeding money to some, organ to, to some community-based organizations across the country. So we're using a, an, an us helping us model wherever possible. Um, so certainly there's a lot more work to be done, but there's also a great amount of resilience and strength and fortitude and willingness and um, anxiousness and worry um, that's happening because folks are still afraid um, to be more than six feet in front of someone. And there's still a lot of misinformation. And so there's so much, there's so many layers um, added on to all the other layers about just being black in America that so many of us are facing. Thank you, Tori. And I think it really strikes me that, you know, this idea of playing catch up, you know, I think for each of you, you do so much in your communities and, you know, just like the taxing of like, you know, not really getting a break. Right. <laughs> but then also I think you're bringing, uh, thank you so much for sharing about all your identities. Um, I mean, and I think the missing piece here is white body supremacy, right. Which sets up uh, black folks is the antithesis of whiteness and then blows out across people of color and and uh, how we in, all internalize anti-blackness. So thank you for bringing that in the conversation because even though I've seen the, the us helping us models uh, and I think Ames was giving us so many stories about people getting right in there and getting strategic and providing resources to rural areas. We haven't seen as much of the conversation about anti-blackness in rural communities. And you're reminding me of how important that conversation is. Someone who I know who is very aware of that conversation is Jamie. Um, can you talk about kind of your experience organizing in rural areas around trans and non-binary issues? And obviously, you know, we're working in the South. Race is such an important part of this conversation. So feel free to, uh, to expand on those areas as well. Yeah, uh, my experience in that regard started way back in 1999 when I was working in Macon, Georgia for Georgia Legal Services Program. I was working primarily doing a legal work, uh, civil legal assistance for individuals living with HIV AIDS. And they covered a 12 county area as far as their service delivery. And so I was doing a lot of uh, rural, a lot of circuit riding at the time. And my experience in that regard is in those days, there were aid service organizations operating in the smaller cities like, like Macon, um, which is a city of approximately 100,000 people. They had an AIDS service organization that started in the late 80s called the Central City AIDS Network. And they provided services and eventually they bought um, their ha housing in the form of uh, a motel that they converted with a lot of uh, Georgia Department of uh, Community Affairs funds into uh, an S single resident occupancy housing with on-site uh, meeting uh, like community space where there was space to have meetings and they had a kitchen and a lot of so a lot of organized rural organizing took place uh, using this aid service organization that had some inf already had some infrastructure as a base of support and eventually we started a trans support group uh, using that space and being in having having that unique kind of job i was able to be in contact with folks from around the circuit and was able to connect them with resources and 
uh, spread the word about the support group and other resources. So that was that was one one story. Uh, another story is when I I was working in Lagrange, Georgia, for seven years um, as a Ten, ten and a half years as a public defender. I lived in Noonan, Georgia for seven and a half years. And just being kind of a public trans person, uh, I, I just kind of people knew who I, who I were and I got just a lot of referrals just being publicly out there doing my thing as trans and I was able to connect a lot of local trans and gender non-binary folks to resources, uh, especially in LaGrange, which is out there on the Alabama border. And uh, there were uh, some folks, some folks that just kind of provided support, um, legal support followed by helping them find resources uh, financial resources and uh, one person um, I even um, bought a bus ticket uh, to so she could get to her family in Atlanta and that's the kind of thing that you can do is um, kind of harnessing these informal networks that just happen because you're in the space doing the work and connecting them to resources and using existing resources that uh, would tend to be trans trans or non-binary friendly to some degree and using uh, those organizations as a platform to build uh, more and specific organizations and networks to specifically service trans and non-binary folks. Thank you, Jamie. And, you know, I appreciate the extensiveness of the ways you've worked across rural environments and how you've been embedded. I mean, so many in our communities come out of rural environments and we end up knowing kind of in, intricately or intimately what it feels like to be in rural communities. Um, so many of us move away from those communities, uh, but then still reach back. So I think that is such an important part of the story that's going on right now. And again, I'm hoping that we can get Ames back, but I think that goes back to what Ames was sharing. I want to move to um, Christopher and continue the conversation with Tori around, welcome back, Ames, um, just about kind of community and lived experiences and the response we can have or re-strategizing as an organization related to COVID-19 and working in rural environments. So Christopher, you know, as you feel comfortable, can you talk about those real life experiences accessing mental health as a trans person during this time? Uh, yes. Um, most of the, well, uh, most of the mental health is like telehealth now. Um, yeah, we're 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 a rural state. Most of our state is rurally isolated. Um, so, from my perspective, it sounds great when they say everything's digital. You can have access, but it doesn't work if you don't have a computer or or a phone or or an internet provider in your area. Um, for myself, you know, I, I, I'm a white I'm a white uh, passing male person. Um, so my privilege of access is a bit a bit better than you know uh, some of my other panel parts in the community, and even for me it's been difficult. So I can only imagine like you know all these other layers. You know, um, before COVID, like before all of this, my general experience with access to healthcare in this state, Arkansas, um, I'm, and I'm also in a metro area, Little Rock. It's our capital. Um, so when I first was accessing mental health way before COVID even came, you know, was a thing, was even on the radio, radar, um, I was actually a state employee and it was still difficult for me as a, someone who, a white person and I'm at work for the state and get these benefits, it was still a very intricate path that I had to take to find, and, and I had, I even had, they offered employee support services. They that was the other element, like even my own job couldn't help me find a competent person 
Like I had to, uh, the person I was stuck with, um, the only reason I was paired with him was because he was a gay man. That that was it, <laughs> you know? And then when I moved from him, the next person, it was because she knew, she knew a trans person in the community. That was it, you know? So it was like all these little intricate steps that I had to take to finally get to somebody who actually had a background in, you know, gender dysphoria, gender identity, and that, that took, that took months, it took months to do, um, so I can only imagine, like, the, the, the layer for everyone else is, is, uh, it's not there, I know it's not there, because the work we do here is educating uh, medical providers, and um, <clears throat> in the COVID crisis, what has come up is, uh, having a comprehensive up-to-date list of providers um, here in our community. There seems to, have, there's always been this effort, there's been efforts to try to come together and make the list comprehensive. Um, hasn't necessarily been successful. Um, and each, so each person has like a piece of the list that we're trying to bring together right now. Um, through Winthrop Rockefeller, there's a group formed here, Arkansas Plus, that they've asked me to help head up. And when we first started out, most of the work seemed to be gravitating towards um, trying to uh, figure out uh, some sort of initiative or tools that we could use as a vehicle in the community to address systemic and racial, racial systemic issues and uh, equity here. Um, but then COVID broke out and that kind of shifted our view, our, not our view, but our, our lens um, towards how do, we re, how do we help these groups regroup in this crisis um, right now. Um, and so part of that has been uh, realizing we all have bits and pieces of this list. And so now we're trying to bring that list together and make it comprehensive and in one place for people to be able to access it. Um, that's one thing we've been doing. Um, community, my, our tech and other small groups, we, um, We've moved to online virtual support. Um, we were trying to access a physical space before all this happened um, because that's people were asking for that, that they wanted a space to be in, to be around other people. Um, but unfortunately, when this broke out, everything shut down. So we had to move to uh, this virtual setting and we host support groups every Sunday and we rotate it out like, uh, there's a space for, you know, for all trans people to come to, and then there's a space that um, non-binary, gender non-conforming people will come to, and then there's a specific space carved out for black and non-black people of color to be able to attend. Um, so we try to rotate out those spaces for everybody to, uh, you know, have time there. And then um, we share, um, somebody mentioned the Zoom, you know, it, it has 40 minutes unless you pay. So oh, we, were, we were lucky enough to be able to pay afford to pay for it and we share it with the other grassroots groups around like you know share that so that they don't they don't have to bear the cost of trying to pick that up um we just share um, um that resource together um there was a there's been a, com a community mutual aid effort here with the small grassroots groups and most of our stuff has just been getting food to people um trying to visit people at a distance like go like you know stand at their door and say hello or whatever give them you know a warm welcome uh, uh i recently just met, went and visited a miss major you know she's had a lot of health stuff going on um i was fortunate enough to be able to go to her home and leave some stuff there and see her and check on her um so there's been an effort for uh, people uh, to move around and try to check on our elders and people that are isolated around us um, uh, you mentioned I worked at Lucy's Place. Um, that's a shelter here for LGBTQ youth. Unfortunately, its doors have shut, um, and I've been dealing with, with that. It's been kind of a, 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 a mess the last couple of weeks because eight, eight youths were displaced to the street. Um, so my own organization and other community partners, we have spent the last couple of weeks trying to figure out how to house these eight eight people and none of these we we don't have that we don't have the money we we're not direct service like my group's an advocacy group um so we we were able to come together as a collaborative to be able to address 
housing and feeding, like those two basic needs for those folks, while um, Lucy's Place sorts out their internal issues, basically. Um, so there was a, it was basically just community coming together, uh, our own people coming together to try to problem solve in real time while this other organization is having their crisis. Um, so that, that popped up in the middle of all this and um, echoing what everybody else has said, like these issues, all of the stuff we're talking about has been ongoing. Like COVID just has shown us the gaps that were there, like, like they're in our face now. Like you can't as easily overlook them or say, oh, that doesn't affect me because it does. It's here. If it wasn't, why would we be, why would we be here on this call? You know, mm -hmm. um, as far as finances, that's a, a worry to me because yes, there are a lot of like COVID response response grants, and we we have been able to get a couple. Um, Ames mentioned something about uh, they they pop up and then they close. We that's happened to us too. We've missed a couple because it's it just like that. It's gone once the money's out there. It's gone. Um, so, you know, trying to grab that resource, um, we were able to grab a little bit of money. Um, before all this, we have a, we have a community relief fund um, that we've changed some of our processes and guidelines on um, so that we can reach more people during the crisis. Um, so briefly, just a brief data. Um, the three years that we've had the program, we were, we were and we were able to help 25 people um, avoid whatever it was that was putting them in a crisis. Since the COVID stuff broke out and we've had to re readjust that, we've been able to help 12 people and since March. So over three years, 25 over a couple months, half of that. You see what I'm saying? So the the demand is definitely there. And it's mostly uh, food security um, and housing security that people are asking for assistance with here. Um, yeah. Which, thank you, Christopher. And it makes sense that we're going to see even more of that because we're only a few months into this pandemic and we know with the unemployment rates, we know how an unemployment, um, inadequate employment already affects trans and non-binary communities, especially communities of color, especially black communities, Latinx communities. So uh, thank you. And I know that in the audience, we've got some awesome folks in mental health here. And, you know, I think that um, you know, for those of us who are providers, I think it's so important to think about how we can, um, you know, extend pro bono services, um, you know, Flex, you know, is chiming in on the chat box just about how collaborate, and I've heard from each of you about how groups are collaborating. And that those collaborations are more than ever right now because they help our efforts be more specific, expand our reach, as each one of you is sharing, especially Christopher, most recently, just it's revealing what we already know. COVID is the great revealer of the inequities. We know we were there. And my hope is um, that we can do something about it. We can get more specific. I did run a poll about um, just a question that um, Ruben, hey Ruben, um, had asked. And, you know, it makes sense that, you know, not everyone responded. So, um, but, you know, 90% of the folks on this call feel like you've been able to get the support you need for isolation. But I think, you know, as we keep hearing from the panelists, this is about access. And so the people, um, I'm concerned about the 10% on this call that you haven't. So drop into the chat box what you might need because we can get you those resources or we can brainstorm with you or at least we can just hold that isolation freaking sucks. Um, and we can hold that space with you. Um, Tori, I was wondering about um, community responses to COVID, and then I'll share a little bit from Hannah um, about a provider, and then we'll go into action and some Q&A with uh, our audience. Awesome, thank you. Um, so as I talk about community responses to COVID, I would first like to give uh, just a couple of shout outs. Um, I haven't done a lot of work in Arkansas, but I know Tiomi Luckett, and I'm glad you mentioned Mother Major, are doing some amazing work. Um, there's Gigi's house there, Sharon Grayson was there for a long time. Um, I've actually been to Asheville uh, at least twice a year for the last four years, um, including there on, on World AIDS Day. 
and I am amazed at the, um, the bubble of resources that folks in Asheville and surrounding areas have created for themselves, trans folks more specifically. Um, it is the type of model that I'd love to see replicated um, and adjusted in other areas. Um, I know that organizations like that in Atlanta, Trans Housing Atlanta Project, which I'm sure Jamie will talk more about, are doing amazing work. Um, I'm uh, still uh, referring people through the program and I hope, I saw someone in the chat um, wonder how they could contribute to some of the organizations. I really hope that folks will not just use their voices, but also use their money and their resources to donate to that and other organizations that are um, providing critical services like housing, um, particularly in places like Atlanta. It's so very, very important. So um, in response to your question, Annalise, um, trans people in COVID, uh, it, it, you've heard it already and I will simply reiterate it. There are a lot of us who've been telling you all all along what's going on. Black folks, we've been telling you all along what's going on. Um, some of you, some folks, I won't say you, some folks just haven't been able to hear us or refuse to hear us. But now you're seeing it, you're living it. And some of you are even experiencing what we've been telling you all along, that there is inequity in health systems, that there is inequity in financial systems, that there is inequity in housing systems, that there is inequity in every system that we have to navigate. Um, we're seeing, um, Maybe three weeks ago was, if I'm remembering correctly, around the 1st of May is when we first started hearing everywhere about racial disparities and how COVID was affecting um, Black people and racial minorities uh, differently than it was with white folks. But we've been telling you that along, all along. We've been telling you that disease hits us differently. Um, we've been telling you that that the systems of care that are there to protect us are really doing more harm than good. And we've been telling you that insurance companies are not taking care of us the way that they should. We've been telling you that uh, employers don't give a crap about us. I almost cursed, but I stopped myself. Um, but we've been telling you this all along. And now that some of you are now seated next to us in the unemployment lines, and seated next to us um, at the post office or at the mailbox waiting for a stimulus check. Now, some of you are seeing what we've been telling you all along. As trans people, we've been telling you all along this stuff is happening. Dr. Tonya Poteet, who I saw is on here, has been doing amazing work for many, many years. And a lot of the research that she's been doing has been telling you this all along. So the thing is, well, what do we do now? What do we do now? We don't just take money and flush it into the trans community, although that does need to happen. But we also use this as an opportunity to correct many of the wrongs that have been inflicted on us for many, many years. Make sure that as we move along, that, um, that we protect pre-existing conditions uh, when it comes to healthcare providers, making sure that all policies um, that people have access to, it, all people, not just trans people, but that all people have access to health insurance policies that will address the totality who, of who we are as individuals. Because as a trans woman, um, you don't just have to, as a black trans woman, you don't just have to address as a medical provider um, my weight, or by uh, a gynecological issues, but you also have to address the fact that I'm a woman who happens to have a prostate. And so a medical provider should be able to take those things into consideration as well. And for people who are um, suffering or who have suffered or unfortunately will suffer from COVID-19 related issues, we have to ensure that insurance policies will still be able to take care of them and that they won't be charged more for services or denied coverage or denied health care. We have to ensure that as people are going back to work, it's not just cisgender heterosexual folks who are going back to work. 
we have to ensure that trans folks and non-binary folks and, and folks who, who um, all queer people and, and all people of color and black people and, and, and everyone on, on the face of the earth goes back to work and is paid a livable wage. Um, we have to, you know, because right now we, we read articles every day, those of us who read the news constantly, that there are a lot of people who are making more money now off of the stimulus check than they are from working 40, 50 hours a week. And that doesn't make sense. It does not make sense from a fiscal standpoint, and it does not make sense from a human standpoint. Um, we have to ensure that folks have jobs to go back to. We have to ensure that folks are not being... Um, that their lives are not in jeopardy because they simply choose to protect their health by wearing a mask in public. Um, we have to make sure that we view people as equals and not as different simply because their skin is a little darker or a little lighter. Um, we have to understand that gender is much more than male or female. And we have to take all of these lessons, these invaluable lessons that we're learning now, and, and put them together in, in some type of toolbox um, and, and some type of toolkit and, and make sure that they all work together to build a better system uh, of care and living and health care and employment. And hey, Kitty and all of the different things that, that we will have to deal with, not just in 2020, but even beyond. And we have to ensure that folks have um, uh, housing as well. Yeah, thank you, Tori. I mean, uh, it's just, you know, rooted in the anti-Blackness of healthcare and education. And you're right, this is the stuff we've been knowing all along. And COVID is that revealer that says yes again and again and again. And if you haven't gotten it, yes again. And I think you're right on. Um, Tanya Petit, Kate Stewart, Alex Marshall, we've got lots of partners on uh, Trans Network. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, if we don't embed attention to race as we, specific, specifically anti-Blackness, as we do work in rural communities, we're lost. Uh, and that's what we're finding out over and over again. Um, we, even though Hannah Jones, who's a family nurse practitioner serving trans and non-binary um, patients in rural Arkansas couldn't join us, we just wanted to run through a couple of her responses. And I think Tori kind of got us started on the call to action. So we'll resume that with Ames after we go through Hannah's responses. We asked Hannah, um, who uses she, her, hers pronouns, what kind of challenges she's experienced as a provider connecting uh, trans folks to resources. And she said her patient panel is heavily made up of low socioeconomic individuals with typically limited health literacy. With that comes all types of typical challenges such as limited finances. I think we've heard this on the panel. Difficulty with transportation, we've heard that. To and from appointments and a lack of understanding of how to navigate the healthcare system. This is huge. Health literacy is huge. Uh, just knowing what the right questions are to ask. And you know, studies have shown, she says that the average American reads at the fourth grade level. So she's always sure not to just assume someone uh, you can send them to a web website or give them a packet of paperwork to read on later and this is reminding me of what the panelists have shared about the us helping us movement and kind of checking on people as Christopher was talking about just you know um, as Tori and Jamie were talking about and Ames too kind of these um, these financial money raising initiatives, but also the literacy piece is I think what Hannah is bringing into the conversation. Becca is going to read the next uh, response from Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. So we asked Hannah, what options have you found available and um, to share with your rural patients? And so she shared that in her corner of Arkansas, um, the local options really are very, very limited. Um, I know a conversation that we've had in this panel as well is, okay, so there's providers, but are there providers who are competent? Are there providers who are not gonna actually cause harm, right? And so that's a piece of this puzzle as well. So um, Hannah shares that the best options, options that she has found are usually online. And so um, she highly recommends them to her patients. They're free usually um, and can be private. Um, she has you know, done a lot of work, a lot of like work trying to find uh, therapists who are informed in her area and tries really hard not to uh, send patients to folks who are doing more harm than good. 
Um, and that's something I think, Christopher, we heard in your, um, your narrative, right, of, of all of these steps that you had to take. It took months to find someone who even had a background or knowledge um, about um, gender identity and gender dysphoria and that sort of thing, which is absolutely heartbreaking um, as a psychologist in training. Uh, hopefully, this is a call to our profession as well. Um, she lists up the names of the Arkansas uh, Trans Equity Collaboration as, as at the top of her list. Um, and there's often local support groups that are not necessarily well publicized that she tries to connect her patients with, like the Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, there's Facebook groups and local PFLAG groups um, and some affirming churches, which we know that especially in the Black trans community, um, the Black church continues to be important to a lot of folks. And so helping, we also know that an aspect of resilience within this community is helping folks navigate and find community and to, to not lose access to that. So um, I think these are some important points that, that Hannah brings forward. And thank you, Becca. And we're just going to run through a couple of uh, other things she shared. Um, we asked, have there been any changes during COVID-19 and has it created op any opportunities? She says the limitations on telehealth visits has been very relaxed during COVID-19. So many visits can now be done over the phone. This has provided a fantastic opportunity to get in with a provider who's affirming, but may be not the most local to you. So I think that is a huge part in getting people connected to resources. Also, these visits have been very low or zero uh, copay. For instance, I know I've done a lot more. You know, I've got a certain amount of pro bono work I can do in an office, but on Zoom, I mean, it just... I gotta be careful about my schedule as a provider, but it just opens up the number of offices because now you know rent is different, but some people have to still pay rent. Anyway, it gets complicated, but I agree that there's been more access to providers if you're in the know, right? As a provider, she questions if the genie can ever be put back in the bottle as far as this goes, but how can insurance say this was appropriate and safe during COVID-19 pandemic, but now it's not. Well, we know <laughs> the money thing can get back in there, but she thinks it's a great opportunity for people who've been marginalized, patients across the board to gain more access to healthcare. And the last question, Becca. Yeah, lastly, we asked Hannah, do you have any advice for providers like you who are looking to broaden their knowledge on trans and non-binary related patients and make their practices more inclusive? Um, so she shares, you know, the very basic and very, very important. If you make an assumption and if you misgender someone, So Ames, Christopher, Jamie, Tori, and then we've got one question in the Q&A, so we want to at least let, leave a few minutes for uh, questions. It is, it's hard to follow, Tori, um, so I will try to uh, just back up everything that, um, that Tori has already said. I think now, right now, is the time to engage in creative and expansive advocacy that generates community-based solutions to address all of the failures of society to keep marginalized people healthy and well. So just one example, Equality North Carolina has a cohort of rural youth empowerment fellows who are all working on COVID-19 issues right now. Um, and one of them, for example, has a phone support group of LGBTQ elders that's intergenerational. So pairing the uh, the youth fellows with um, with elders who are seeking connection. And I, I will actually have an article in um, uh, an issue this summer of the NC Medical Journal about increasing health equity for, um, for transgender elders in particular. Um, you should see the, the first draft of it was something like, can you explain what transition is? So it, it was a little longer than anticipated. But we talk, I guess, what has really <clears throat> been calling to me as a, a white person trying to follow black leadership and um, dismantle white supremacy wherever I can. Um, I've been really struck by how the irony of calling something minority stress as a motivator of social determinants of health when I think 
we should be calling these oppression determinants of health that are caused by discrimination stress. And when we use these passive terms like social or minority stress, I think it serves to shift the blame uh, to the people who are the most impacted um, as opposed to um, holding white supremacy accountable, which is ultimately what is motivating, as Tori has pointed out, uh, um, these inequities that have been there all along. So um, I saw some uh, points by Arlene in the, um, in the chat box about um, telehealth. Like we have discovered that suddenly telehealth services are acceptable as a means of delivering healthcare because privileged white folks like me need to be able to get our asthma medication so that we don't get even sicker if we contract the, corona, the coronavirus. So when privileged white folks no longer have to stay at home, we can't pull away those telehealth services that are fulfilling really important needs in rural areas. And partner to that, we have also seen uh, policymakers taking on the lack of uniform broadband access. Like it's really hard to have telehealth be able to make a dent if people don't have any access to the internet in order to be able to keep those appointments. Um, so if utility companies are suddenly able to make those services available at low or no cost during a pandemic, then we can't let them off the hook when the emergency passes for white folks. There cannot be this returning to normal after the pandemic because that normal only served privileged white people. And there can't be any like going back to the way things were before the pandemic because we're all now on notice that the ways that healthcare is failing all marginalized people in the United States. So we, we know now what is not working, but we also know that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we have this opportunity to engage in, in generative local solutions that result in policy that ultimately increases health equity for marginalized people, including transgender people. But I, I again call up, we cannot be, it's important for us to um, be um, lauding and lifting up um, all of these community-based supports that are so important and all of the healthcare providers who are stepping into the breach right now. And a lot of folks um, like me, uh, <laughs> are hearing these things and saying, yes, thank you so much for all that you're doing during this crisis. And we think like that's enough. And then we can walk away and not address any of the issues that are underlying it. And it's important for, I think in particular for white people to hold other white people accountable to not um, going back to normal. Thank you. Thank you, Ames. Um, we just have a couple of uh, minutes left. So Christopher, Jamie, Tori, I'm going to give you like 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that was really, that. oh, both of that was awesome. So I won't repeat all of that um, to reiterate that. Um, but what I will say is this, um, yes, I've noticed like mental health services, the costs have gone down or they're offered for free or lower cost right now. Um, that can't go away. And, and in my experience with trying to access healthcare for myself and uh, my, my community uh, is being met with, well, well, we got to do what the insurance says, or, well, we got to do this. Well, you're, no, honey, you're telling me about a barrier that I already know. I'm telling you to turn and use your privilege and access to break that barrier down for me. Like, don't tell me that it's there. I, I know that it is. I'm asking you to use your privilege and access to uh, challenge that. Don't just tell me, oh, that's just the way it is, especially now in this crisis where we can see that you can challenge that and offer your service free or at a reduced charge or work around whatever it is, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So my, my um, thing that I want to leave people with is to challenge those gatekeeping barriers. Don't just tell us, oh, well, this is why I can't do it. Well, I know that you can't. That's why I'm here. You don't have to tell me about the bear I already know. I need you to use your privilege and access to help me dismantle it. So that's what I'll leave with. Love it. Thank you. Jamie? Yeah, just two things. I think uh, 
as as a white person in the uh, nonprofit uh, world, I think it's it's especially in the South. It's so crucial to uh, mentor, promote, and engage uh, black leadership in the nonprofit sector, and lay and enable the transition to uh, black folks taking uh, control of and being leaders in these uh, nonprofit organizations that especially in the South are historically uh, mostly white, uh, serving black communities. Uh, there's all kinds of dynamics that uh, need to be changed in that regard. And second, um, there are, especially, you know, in the, there may be moratoriums for evictions right now for housing that's connected to governments like city of Atlanta or the federal government. And there's uh, going to be a wave, I think, of evictions once all these moratoriums are lifted. So we need to prepare because when you have uh, secure housing, that leads to better health, health outcomes. And so it's gonna be important uh, for where available for folks to advocate for uh, rent relief and forgiveness uh, throughout the period of the, the, this period of the pandemic shelter at home period. I think that's going to be hugely crucial or else we're going to, it's just going to make the housing crisis, which was already a crisis before the pandemic, even worse. All right. Final words, Tori. All right. I'll make this pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> Following something that Christopher said, um, I encourage each of us to acknowledge our pri privilege, own it, and then use your powers for good versus evil. Um, I would also say be very, very mindful of uh, how we absorb information. Um, if you want to know how to properly take care as a provider, if you want to know how to properly take care of trans people, ask trans people. If you want to know how to provide uh, appropriate health care now, unless we're getting paid to be teachers, keep that in mind that we are, you know, that so, um, but if you want to know uh, how to take care of us, ask us, incorporate us into the work that you're doing. And, and one last point I'd like to leave, 1970 was a wonderful year. Um, it was a great year because both Annalise and I were born in 1970. Um, it, was, it was a great year because in 1970, um, a major motion picture um, by the name of Myra Breckenridge was released, um, starring Raquel Welch. It's a cult classic now. And I, I'll be really succinct with this. And I always mention, I mention that movie a lot because in 1970, the word transgendered with a D was used to describe Raquel Welch's character in that movie. And it's so ironic because in 1970, she was considered the most beautiful woman in the world. And yet in 2020, we're still saying we don't know how to treat trans people and we don't see trans people and, and, and uh, people think it's such a new thing. And, and my very, very last point, in 1970 also, um, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera created the Star House. And STAR stands for uh, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionary House. And it was a house, it was an apartment that they paid the rent on from Sucking Dick in, 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 on Christopher Street and in Greenwich Village in New York. And it was, the purpose of it was to house folks who were like them, um, folks who we would use terms like transsexual and transgender for now. They use terms like cross-dresser and transvestite uh, then. But it's important to note that in 1970, they figured out how to do it. And yet, many of us who provide services are still saying, we don't know how to house trans people in 2020. Um, so I, I, will, I will use that. I was gonna talk a little bit more about uh, something else, but I think that's it. You get my point. Um, we know how to do it. We, we heard the point and yeah, we're yeah. taking it in. Folks, thank you all today. I know we ran a little late and we didn't get as much time for audience questions, but I think this was an awesome discussion. Please join us on Facebook. You know, if you haven't seen Arundhati Roy's work around the pandemic as a portal, you know, check it out. She talks about, you know, we, we aren't going back. We just aren't 
Uh, I think Hannah was saying that too, but where we go now, it is up to us. The pandemic is a portal. Let's build that more liberatory um, future for all of us, for trans and non-binary people, for black people, for people who experience poverty and homelessness and you know, all the things that we should know should not be happening in 2020 in our society today. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Becca, for your help organizing. We send love to everyone. And um, please feel free to get in touch with Trans Network if you need anything. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.